There's a scripture in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. And it's a key verse, and yet most preachers just ignore it, roll over top of it. They do not uh, talk about it. And they don't talk about it because of tradition. The Bible says the traditions of men make the word of God of none effect. So we have this tradition uh, that uh, makes the word of God of none effect. It's an attack on something that's necessary. The fact that Jesus died and rose again does not in itself accomplish what needed to happen. You say, but I thought it was his death, his burial, his resurrection. Yes, but in the old, olden times, and in throughout all history, people realized uh, and different cultures make it very plain that if a person dies and comes back in a day or a day and a half, it's not really considered a fact that they were in fact dead. Let's read this. Uh, St. Matthew's chapter uh, 12, verse 38. Then certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. We, sh we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Now, is it important that this is a sign? Jesus said, this is the only sign that's going to be given to this generation. And so Satan made the truth obscure. He hid the truth from the ages. He hid the truth over the last 2,000 years. The sign that Jesus said was given to the generation has been overlooked because of tradition. And people will tell you today, well, it's not really important if he, if he was dead for three days or just one and a half days, that's not important. It's a sign. It is the sign. It is the only sign given to this generation, Jesus said. Let's look at it again. 38, go back to verse 38. A certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, Master, we will see a sign from thee. And he answered and said unto them, he might as well have said to them, you're evil and adulterous generation. But he said, he was trying to be polite. He said, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. What did he just say? You people are evil and adulterous. <laughs> Whoa. No, he didn't. He didn't say that. Yes, he did. They said, we seek a sign. And he says, evil and adulterous generations seek a sign. He was called them evil and adulterous. <clears throat> Some people got offended this morning when I said, your children are all crumb snatchers. Their hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Not my kid. Not, what, what, don't, don't talk about children like that. 
well, let your traditions make the word of God a none effect. But, but the word of God is very clear. Your children are sinners. That's right. That's right. They were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but my kid is so sweet. Well, that's what all parents say till they send their kids to school and the teacher sends a note home. Your kid was pulling another kid's hair in school today. Would you please correct your children, your child? So let's read it again. Certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered saying, And see, we overlook the word answered. But that comes as a direct result of, for by thy words, verse 37. Look at verse 37. By thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Then the certain Pharisees answered. They answered, but they didn't answer what he was talking about. They answered, they wanted to change the subject. Don't talk about by our words will be justified, by our words will be condemned. So they changed the subject. And they said, Master, we would see a sign from thee. Verse 39. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. But there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. What does Jonas have to do with this? For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, then Jonas is here. So why is the resistance when we say Jesus was not crucified on Friday? Oh, well, I, 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 you know, I, that's your opinion, but I believe that he was crucified on Friday because after all the church has taught that for the last 2,000 years. Yes, and Satan wanted the church to teach it. That's right. That's right. And because you were dumb Gentiles led about by all your insanity, that's what Paul the Apostle alludes to, you don't know. True Orthodox Jews know that the Passover was on my birthday. That's how they celebrate it. It really is. April the 14th. Look it up. Look at the month, Jewish calendar. And it's not on a Saturday necessarily, though sometimes uh, it is on a Saturday. So on, on, a Saturday, on, a, on a Passover day, when it lands on April the 14th, it becomes, there are two Sabbaths in one day. So they just celebrate the Passover and that satisfies everything. But the Passover is on a particular day. You know, have you heard anything about that before I started preaching today? Where'd you hear about that? Timmy? You mean your ex-husband? Oh, he said something. Nobody else heard anything about Jesus was not crucified on Friday, but he was crucified on Wednesday? My son John said that today. At communion time. Do you remember that? How many of you remember reacting to what he said? Or how many, it just went like, whoop, 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 whoop. Right over your head. You go 
and try to tell a religious person that Jesus was not crucified on Friday and then, and then get ready. Hi, yay. Hi, yay. You got to be ready to fight. Them are fighting words. Well, I, people say this to me. Well, it's not important. It doesn't affect my salvation. Oh, yes, it does. How does it affect my salvation, Pastor Bennett? I'm saved by the blood of Jesus. But if the blood of Jesus didn't come from someone who was officially dead, then you don't have salvation. You mean a person's not officially dead till they're dead for three days? That's exactly what I'm telling you. Look, people question whether Jesus died at all. They question whether he was, whether he was resurrected from the dead. The rumor was put out right after Jesus was raised from the dead. The disciples came and stole his body. Yeah with a Roman, you know, bunch of soldiers there to protect his dead body. They were told to protect his dead body because we do not want anyone to ever say that Jesus came out of that grave. We finally drained his blood and we want to make sure he's not just dead but D-E-A-D -E dead. So they put a bunch of guards around that place. Angel came, knocked them all out with one word, you know. Roll the stone away. The Holy Ghost goes into that tomb. And you cannot have salvation unless you believe that God has raised him from the dead. In Jamaica West Ind I mean in Haiti West Indies, when a person dies in their outside of the Christian community, guess how they bury them? Anybody know? Pat knows. They bury the people face down and they put rocks in their hands, the palms of their hands, two big rocks to make sure they don't come out of that coffin. That's their tradition. Because over there in Haiti, they have this special poison from a blowfish, of all things. And that poison, um, they can come into a person's home or meet the man on the, on the road, prick him, put that poison in his body, and he will die, so to speak. That's right. That's right. And in those countries, they have to put a person in the ground within 24 hours. And they usually put people watching over the grave, just like they did in Jesus' time. <clears throat> you know why they do that? Because this poison from the blowfish makes the whole body slow down. And the heart beats only one time every minute and a half. And it keeps them alive. And so the witch doctor that poisoned his enemy watches diligently to make sure where they're buried. And then they come back and they dig up the body within three days. If it's over three days, they can't get them back alive. But if it's within three days, they can get the body out of the ground, open up that casket, that wooden box they're buried in, 
remove those stones from their hands and give them a shot of something else and the person comes back and then they keep them in a semi-conscious state and they make that person for the next 20 years or so work their fields and they're called zombies. You don't think this zombie stuff comes out of thin air, do you? It's a very known thing, very known in Haiti, West Indies, that a witch doctor died, accidentally died. And he, was, he had way up in the mountains these people looking after his fields. And they were 20 of them, 15 or 20 of them. And when he died, they didn't know what to do because they'd been drugged for 15 years, 20 years. Some 10. Then one guy walked back into a village. Somebody said, I know that he looks just like this other family. Let's find out if that person's still in the ground. They dug up his casket. He wasn't in the casket. You know why? Because he was standing there in the village going, huh? What do you want me to do? Huh? They found these people alive. Why? Because in the, in the Far Eastern culture, if you're not dead for three days, you're not really D-E-A-D -E dead. We found this in the country of Nepal. We find it in different cultures around the world. Different cultures. But I'm going to give you the sign of Jonas. The only sign that's going to be given. He's going to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He said, I thought we were going to hear a resurrection story. We are. We're going to hear a resurrection story of a man who was really, really dead. And the trial run of his resurrection was when Jesus was over here in another village someplace with his disciples and they bring word to him, he whom you love is not feeling good. He's really, really sick. Come and pray for him, Jesus. The note from the sister said. And Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, Not now. We're going to stay here a few more days. Then, out of nowhere, Jesus says to his disciples, I'm uh, going to go. And uh, wake up Lazarus. And the disciples said, Lord, uh, now we know a little bit about life. I mean, you're pretty, you're pretty smart, Jesus. But there's some things, you, you, you know, we know because we're fishermen. And we, want, we, we just let you in on this. Uh, if a person is sick and then they're sleeping... He's doing pretty good. That's good for him. He needs to sleep. <clears throat> and Jesus said, let me say this plainly to you. Because of my faith, I didn't want to say it, but because of your arrogance and what you think you know and what you think is the total reason why I stayed here, and I didn't go pray for him three days before is because now he's dead. And he still didn't explain to them what was going on. 
But this was, G, was the Father's object lesson to the Son. Trust me. I can take care of you. And you're going to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. But don't be afraid, son. My spirit is capable of raising you from the dead after three days. That's all Lazarus' resurrection was about. It was about the father showing the son, I got your back. And then he's in debate with these scribes and Pharisees. And you can tell he's been thinking about this a little bit. Because he says, the only sign that's going to be given this generation is the sign of Jonas. As Jonas was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. This is the only sign. But it's, it's really not important, Pastor Bennett. I mean, if he died on Friday, if he died on Saturday, if he died on Wednesday or Thursday, it, it really doesn't make any difference. Yes, it does. It's the only sign. Your salvation is directly attached to this sign. Your salvation. I know, it, I know it's not the blood of Jesus I'm preaching right now, but it's the sign that he is Messiah. It's the sign that God raised him from the dead because no witch doctor could do that. Lest you think I'm crazy, trust me, I've been in 52 foreign countries and I know the mysticism around the world. I don't know all the mysticism, but I know a lot of it. There are people in the Orient and people in the Far East that do this demonstration. They suspend themselves in water for three days and three nights. They're in water. People can watch them 24 hours a day. You can come see it. It's not a magician's trick. And they have to have the closest of kin to stand by and stay awake those three days and three nights. They cannot go to sleep because they are going to hold the spirit of the person that's being suspended in the water for three days and three nights. Then they pull them out, and they wake them up. They slap their faces, they pump on their chest, they do everything they can. They don't know anything about, uh, you know. They're not shocking their heart back. Many times they lose them. There are so many stories similar to this one in Haiti, West Indies, where a man will be walking down the road and he'll see a dog run by, a pack of dogs, and one dog has a cigar in its mouth. You say, what in the world? Because the witch doctor will lean against the tree slow his heart rate down, yield himself to satanic powers, his spirit will leave him, he'll go into the dog, run down the street, oh, by the way, I need my cigar, and he'll come back and get the cigar. <laughs> I'm not saying the dog's smoking a cigar, he just got it in his mouth. Witch doctors will go into a cat, the cat will go into a house, bring out a piece of meat, bring it back to the witch doctor, put it on his stomach, then the witch doctor gets out of the cat and goes back into the, it's called soul travel. The, there are people that seek diligently for satanic power to do those things. 
That's why this is a sign. It's important because nobody leaves their body for three days or more and comes back to tell it. I know that this is irrelevant to everybody here, and I know that you don't really care. But I care today because this is the only sign. You say what you want to say about it. I'm telling you, this is the only sign given this generation. Jesus died on April the 14th, which happened to be, it had to have been a a Wednesday. And he was crucified. They had to get him off the cross before the Sabbath begun. Because Wednesday at 6 to Thursday at 6 was a Passover Sabbath. Six o'clock in the evening, Passover lifts, and so the women get busy. Shh, we got to get busy. We got to get busy. Get busy. So Thursday at six, it's too late. The sun's down, but we got Friday morning. So Friday morning, they get busy, real busy, and they start making the spices. By the time they get everything made, it's six o'clock Friday afternoon, and we can't go to the tomb. And our precious Lord and Savior's body's been in there. Since Wednesday, it's before six, just before six, Joseph of Arimathea gets permission to take Jesus' body off the cross and puts it in his own grave, which is already hollowed out and already ready. Joseph said, this is is for my burial, but it's right there. And it just happens to be right underneath the place of the skull. He was crucified on top of this hill. Joseph of Arimathea's burial tomb was right at the foot of that place of the skull. When you go there and you stand at the bus, it's where the bus is across the street from that place of the skull is where the bus system runs. The major bu- God put the bus company right there. So you can go right there, you can look up, and you can see the two eye sockets in the mouth. You can see the whole skull. Golgotha, the place of the skull. He gets him off the cross, quickly wraps him in linen, places him in this tomb, puts a stone there, and the Sanhedrin comes and says, this isn't right. You let them have his body. We need a Roman set of soldiers. And Pilate says, you got your own Roman soldiers. Put your soldiers there. You've got a soldiers that are assigned to you. And they put them there to watch, make sure nobody messes with the tomb. Wednesday night, 6 o'clock. Thursday night. Everybody say day one. day one. Thursday night to Friday night. Day two. Friday night at six o'clock till Saturday night at six o'clock is three days and three nights. But it's too late to do anything now. Because it's 6 o'clock. You don't go traveling on those Roman roads after 6 o'clock when the sun's down. And so you go, you wait till the first day of the week. Sometime during that night, the Holy Ghost goes into the tomb and raises Jesus from the dead. Now, let me prove this to you in Scripture. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 19. John chapter 19, after this, verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, he cries out, he says, I thirst. Now, there was a set a vessel full of vinegar. They filled a sponge with vinegar and put it 
upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received this vinegar, people I've heard preachers preach, Jesus said, pff, pff, I don't want that vinegar. Jesus took some of it. He received it. He said, then he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not be not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for the Sabbath day was an high day. They besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and break and of the other which was crucified with Christ. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was dead already. They didn't break his legs because it was written, none of his bones shall be broken. One of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side. And we know he had no blood left in him because out of his side came blood and water. And he was in that tomb three nights and three days. Three days and three nights. Three days and three nights. And he comes out of that tomb. So why do you want to share with us and mess us up with our Good Friday traditions and all that? I'm not trying to mess up your traditions. I'm just wanting to point out that Jesus came back from the grave. Up from the grave he arose. He didn't come out of a eastern zombie being pricked with a blowfish. It was not a magician's trick. It was the resurrection of the son of the living God. And what I wanted to do today was take you through a trek of the Old Testament because I want you to see this and I don't have time and I'm not going to go into it but I'm going to blow your minds in the next five minutes. I'm going to tell you a little something here. That hanging on the cross is a fulfillment of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Go to it. Genesis 3, verse 15. And I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Her seed shall bruise your head, devil, and you will bruise his heel. So hanging on the cross was not just a man. Jesus, his father, was not Joseph. Jesus' father was God. And Jesus' mother was not Mary. Huh? Huh? What was hanging on the cross was the seed of the woman. The, the seed that was put in the woman. Mary mothered Jesus, but in Jesus. Do you, do you think that uh, if there's in vitro fertilization, if, if, if my daughter could not have a baby and my wife had a baby for my daughter, but it was my daughter's 
egg and my son-in-law's sperm, would my wife be the mother of that baby or would she just be carrying that baby? The mother is the mother. The father is the father. And, in, and the blood is the focus. And when a woman's egg, which is not called seed in any biological book or any way, shape, and form, is the seed of a woman, it has never existed. Women have egg. Men have the seed. The spermatozoa was God's creation and the egg was God's because if it if the if the egg was Mary's egg then 23 of every chromosome in the cells of Jesus's blood would have been Mary's blood and Jesus would be as sinful as me God did not say the child of the woman did not say the egg of the woman but said the seed of the woman it's the seed of God in the earth which Adam was and Eve was the seed of God in the earth Adam was created without a belly button Eve was taken from the side of Adam. That's right. Every blood corpuscle in Eve's body was the blood of God. And every single corpuscle, red corpuscle in the body of Adam was God's blood. That's right. God had blood in the earth. Yes. And in the garden, Woman stood and man stood together, it says. Look it up for yourself. They were together. When they were looking at that tree they were not supposed to partake of, Satan says to the woman, the woman says to the devil, the devil says to the woman, the woman says to the devil, read it for yourself. And then she took and gave it, she took it and ate it and gave it to her husband who was with her. It says, clears the bell. If she had partaken of that, it was not an apple, folks. It was a, a fruit that caused people to have the knowledge of good and evil. And up till the time Eve took of that fruit, she did not know anything that was good. She did not know anything that was evil. She only knew God. The problem with our theology is that we think that when they partook of that fruit, they learned evil. That's not true. They learned good and evil. And it's the good things in life that keep us from the best. Learning good was very bad. You say, why is it bad? You, we want to know good. No, I don't. I'm sick of knowing good. I need to know God. That's right. Amen. See, good is an addition to God because God is G-O-D. Good is G-O-O-D. Right. Right. And two-thirds of God is go. <laughs> trying to trying to lighten this mood up a little bit here I don't want y'all crucifying me today listen to me man and woman never saw each other's nakedness until they bit the fruit because the day you eat of this fruit 
surely die. And the Bible says they lived another six or seven hundred years after they ate the fruit. Come on, somebody. So did they die? Satan said the truth. He says, you eat this fruit, you're not, you're not going to die. God knows that when you eat this fruit, you'll be like God. Mm -hmm. When they ate that fruit, the pureness, the purity, the righteousness of God cut off. And the light that made them look like a beam of light shut down. God turned the light off. Until then, being overweight was not a major problem. Because no man ever saw his fat wife or would not have seen his fat wife. Women would have not seen how silly men really look. You know, if, you, if you don't talk to your wife a whole bunch, you know, I... There's, there's some idiots in the world. There, there has been some idiots that on the wedding night, they decided, here I am, baby. And the woman says, oh, my God, what have I gotten myself into? A smart man will keep his clothes on until he does some fine talking. All you men that think you look so great in the buff your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? God designed marriage so that you'd have to go into her light and she come into your light and then you can have some delight. Oh, hallelujah. I know I've quit preaching and gone to meddling, but you guys got to get this thing straight. In the garden, God's light was turned off. And gee, and God said, look it up for yourself. Because you did this, devil, the seed of the woman's going to bruise your head. And you're going to bruise the seed of the woman's heel. He said to the man, because you have listened to the voice of your wife. Right. There's nothing wrong with listening to your wife. Some of you guys would be a lot smarter if you did. <laughs> but you hearken to the voice of your wife. Instead of saying, who are you talking to, devil? That's right. And then it would have required him to say, I'm talking to your lovely, wonderful wife over here. <laughs> and then you could have said, Adam could have said, Quit talking to my wife. That's right. She's my wife. That's right. But Eve looks over with her two little beady eyes shining through the, the bright light of her head. <laughs> and she notices that Adam is fascinated with that fruit just as much as she is, so she helps him out. She reaches her hand up, and she's looking at her husband. He doesn't say no. So here's, here's another rule you men need to know. If you don't say no, it means you're saying yes. Honey, I think I'm going to go shopping and spend half of your money. Man, that's the time to say no. If you don't say no, she's trotting to the store, folks. Because you've just given your approval. The Bible says the woman was tricked, but the man was not tricked. When the man took that fruit from his wife and took a chunk out of it, he was committing high treason against God. It was not the wife's fault. It was the man's fault. Every woman look at your husband and say, it was not my fault, honey. All right, now you got it. 
Michael Walker, your wife says it was not her fault. <laughs> I'm so glad my wife's not here. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> so, is anybody still with me? Satan wanted to destroy the seed of the woman because if he could destroy the seed of the woman, he could keep the Messiah from coming. He could keep his head from getting a, a nail through it. Right. Let me tell you something, folks. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light, where the burden of my heart rolled away, it was at the cross. Yes. It was not just the Son of God. It was the seed. The seed that brought the precious blood of God back into the earth. And Jesus, living a sinful life, did not mess up his blood. And so therefore he gave his blood. And for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He died for you. He died for me. And he was willing to give up the ghost. He said, Father, I commend my spirit into your hands Hello, Father. Are you listening to me? Because I'm about to give up the ghost. You've got to step in and hold it all together. And at that moment that Jesus screamed out, it is finished, and he gave up the ghost. God had to step in and hold the world together because the Bible says the rocks rent. The earth was about to disintegrate into trillions of little pieces and fly off into space because the creator of the world was giving up the ghost because in him all things are held together. And the rocks rent. Earth started coming apart at the seams. They say every rock prior to year 2000 years ago prior to the death of Christ has fissures in it you never find a rock after that's 2000 or more years old that doesn't have fissures in it new, new rocks that form some of them get fissures in them as well Volcanic rock, all have fissures in it prior to Christ. Maybe when the, they're cooling down, they get some fissures of the new rocks. But there are some, I want to say, in, 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 ingenious rocks. I don't know how to say it. Whatever. I'm glad you, I'm glad you got an education. So. That's not even a, a real serious point, but what I'm trying to tell you is that the rocks rent. That's right. That's right. Something was happening. Darkness, so dark you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. Right. Psalms 22 says exactly what happened at the cross when it got real dark. The bulls of Basham were surrounding his crucifixion. Because the seed of the woman was dead. The dogs spit on him. Look it up for you. Psalms 22 would tell you everything that happened that no man could see because God blackened it out. God says, I can't look on sin, and he became sin. So God backs up on the cross, and he covers what really happened at the cross. Many people have been crucified, but none of them suffered like Jesus Christ. It was not the stripes on his back, the spear in his side. It was not the crown of thorns on his head. It was not the whip. But it was the supernatural separation of himself from God. And Satan danced around like a bunch of hyenas only to find out on the third day when the Holy Ghost went into that tomb 
He came in. And he raised Jesus from the dead. Yes. And all over the spirit world, you could hear Satan going, No! <laughs> sort of what happened to Nancy Pelosi and Schumer. <laughs> All those demons are still screaming, what happened? Because the Bible says in Corinthians, it says, had the princes of this world known, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. That's what Pat's poem was. This service has been a very prophetic service. But what I want you to end the service with in your hearts today is simply this. Jesus Christ died for the sins of the whole world. But he was not just a man. He was not just the son of God. He was the seed of the woman that was going to bruise Satan's head. And on the cross was the seed of the woman. And when Satan was driving that stake through the feet of Jesus. He was driving a rod through his own head. Jesus died for your sins and in his death he shed the blood. Everybody say he shed the blood of God in the earth. The, the, the blood of God that had 46 chromosomes, 23 from the egg, 23 from the sperm that was put into Mary. And those 46 chromosomes had the perfect DNA that went all the way back to Adam. And that DNA was exactly, probably like Adam's, exact copy because Jesus is called the second Adam. Very complex and yet it's very simple. You cannot be saved unless you confess with your mouth, listen to me carefully, that Jesus is your Lord. You cannot be saved unless you confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord and unless you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from his sleep. No, from the dead. I prove to you today that Jesus was D-E-A-D -E dead. He was there three days and three nights. No man has ever come back after three days and three nights being dead except Lazarus and Jesus Christ. No mysti mystical person can bring somebody back after three days. Nobody in the world believes it can be done. Nobody can hold a person's body in suspension for three days and three nights. I don't care how close a relative you are. You're going to die if you don't get out of that thing within three days. But Jesus paid it all. So today, the young people would like to know how many of you enjoyed the whole service today. Those kids over there, they wanted to know that. How many enjoyed it? So they also want to know how many of you all know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So let me see your hands. Raise your hands. I'm looking from one side to the other. If I can find one person that doesn't know Jesus, I will not embarrass you. Keep your hand down if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior. If you know him, raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you for keeping your hands up. Thank you. I'm looking carefully. That's good. So how many of you believe that Jesus is your Lord? Raise your hand. How many of you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead? Raise your hand. Then I want you to put your hand right here and say, I am saved. Now say it like you mean it. Say, I am saved. Say, I am saved. Say, I am saved. Now say, I am saved. I think you're almost there. 
If you're saved, stand, to your, stand with me to your feet and sing with this choir. And if you need special prayer today, I'll be glad to pray for you. Special thanks for Robbie's uh, parents. Is it your parents or your wife's parents? Rita's parents. So glad to have you all today. God bless you all. God bless each one of you for being here. Rose Baker's family's here. A lot of y'all are here. God bless each one of you for being here today. And I want to challenge you to come back next Sunday. And if you'd like to be a part of this choir, Ruthie's looking for more people that'll sing with her. God bless each one of you for being here. Sing, and then you're dismissed. God bless you.